So really today is all about wastewater, what I think is the coolest thing that we do. Of but of course, that's that's my background is, is wastewater. WaterTech does a lot of different things, but um, today we're focused on wastewater. This morning is really about uh, chemical treatment, metals removal, and then later in the day we get to the really cool stuff, which is biological treatment. Um, so if you can make it through the morning, the real good stuff comes after lunch. Just kidding, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so Chris will be presenting. We will have one remote presenter as well, um, and so we'll Hopefully the technology on that will all work yeah, as well too. Okay, so our first presenter is Chris Fox. He's our director of business development for wastewater. Uh, I don't know, 30 years in in the business doing 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 wastewater. Um, the gray hair shows it, um, but he'll start us off and then and we'll go from there. Well, let's get into it. Here we are, August 26th, um, post COVID. So my uh, my daughters uh, took a photo. This is up in. Ellison Bay in, in Door County, they were kayaking in June. And I was looking at this photo saying, wow, that is gorgeous. And just think of, you know, what we do for a living has an impact on, on water everywhere and how fun it is to be able to uh, enjoy it. So just a, just a feel good to get us started here this morning. What do you think of that picture? Should that, should that be in a, in a magazine somewhere? I should be in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. All right, so our goals here today are obviously to educate. And what I really enjoy, and what I think one of the best the best aspects of having people here is collaborating and, and kind of learning from one another. So obviously, uh, it would be it would be nice if you could, in your in your careers and in your uh, at your uh, businesses, save time and, and figure out ways to save money. We can all use a, a few uh, less headaches. And hopefully, you know, one or two nuggets you'll take away from here today that'll help reduce those. And of course, obviously, and most importantly, is um, maybe, maybe something you'll learn today will help you in some situation, you know, maintain compliance for your businesses. Because at the end of the day, that's kind of the important thing, right? All right, topics we're going to talk. Uh, pH adjustment is number one up there for a reason. Get kind of specific into coagulation and how that all works, flocculation, different types of treatment, treatment methods, and we'll give you a little bit of a, a snapshot on some dewatering equipment. And, and so Joel and John are going to get into some of these a little bit more uh, in depth a little bit later on today. So my old friend, pH adjustment. So what does pH stand for? And you guys aren't allowed to, to say. And we're all familiar with uh, those, right? Those uh, analyzers and probes. Those probes that have to be cleaned, right? So what does pH stand for? Anybody know? <clears throat> Potential of hydrogen. Close enough, you get the first poop emoji. <laughs> I have a thing about poop emojis. And it's even in plastic, so it doesn't get COVID, right? So one of the most important things in our business is pH. Do we all agree? Because if it's not right, nothing else tends to work. Right, Jake? Been there, done that. So what is pH? So it's this balance of hydrogen and hydroxide ions. And obviously the more uh, hydrogen ions you have, the more acidic the waste stream. The more hydroxide ions, the more basic. But you guys probably already knew that. Obviously another way to describe, you know, what is a base and what is an, uh, an acid. Most of you probably know this, but there may be some people out there who don't. And coincidentally enough, we have I just saw this today. We have this pH water, and apparently uh, pH 9.5 is the best pH to drink water. Does anybody know that? I had never heard that before. But it's, it absor absorbs better in your. Oh, it's a perfect hydration. So, in case you want some, there's they're over in the cooler. 
So we all understand the, the pH curves and, and how those all work. And we have a couple of things that we can use typically, sulfuric acid, sometimes hydrochloric acid, most times hydrochloric acid is used to, to clean or CIP systems, right? Because muriatic isn't very fun, it kind of gases off. Sulfuric, sulfuric is really kind of the mainstay. I've seen more people now using carbon dioxide. I don't know if anybody here uses carbon dioxide. The, the methane industry, these bioreactors are producing carbon dioxide and it's become more available and more less expensive. Some of you may want to even consider it for treatment. Uh, not really good though if you have high calcium water, high hardness, because what happens, you precipitate calcium carbonate scale, right? But in certain circumstances, you know, in particular, if the plant's already using carbon dioxide for something else, it's something to think about. Um, many of you are, are using lime these days and uh, make hydroxide. It seems to be a, um, people are starting to shy away from uh, caustic or sodium hydroxide, the 50% solution, and going to safer alternatives. I know there's, there's <laughs> not always the easiest handling uh, of lime, but really there are, are two benefits to using lime. It really has two strengths. One is the fact that it's providing calcium, uh, kind of acts as a, a coagulant, if you look at it that way, and it also adds the hydroxide, whereas caustic just, just adds hydroxide. There's no coagulant value in there at all. And sodium carbonate was, you know, is used here and there, not very often. Anybody in here using sodium carbonate? I know you have a customer <laughs> you talked about that this morning. Yeah. All right, so let's uh, jump into coagulants. So coagulant really is, um, uh, or coagulation, I don't like the word uh, clumping, I guess agglomeration might be a better way of describing it. But what, what we're trying to do is neutralize these, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, obviously, um, really to get, to get that, that process of, of liquid solid separation started. And we all know, uh, Rob, about PINFLOC, right? And the other thing that's a little bit different about coagulants when it's compared to flocculants is the has both a chemical, or can, I should say, have both a chemical and physical reaction. The physical reaction is the charge neutralization. The chemical reaction can be what, guys? Let's say, let's say we're using ferric chloride. What might you be doing with ferric chloride? Especially these days. For phosphorus. For phosphorus removal, exactly. Or other things, maybe even sulfide removal. So a lot of times the it's not only you know neutralizing charge, it's also providing an additional benefit as a compound that's creating a, a new or a, a element that's creating a new compound. A little different than uh, flocculation. So everything in nature, almost everything in nature, is negatively charged. So when we add something, or when we have a, a, a stable colloidal suspension here, that, that beaker might sit there for two weeks and not separate because those, those are those repulsive, repulsing forces. Kind of like if you take a magnet and you take the two leg sides of a magnet, you get that feeling. It's like, doesn't want to go together. And then you turn it around and it comes together. It's kind of the same thing that's going on in, in a solution of water. Those are called Van der Waals forces. So what we're trying to do here, um, and sometimes this is easier said than done, is destabilize that charge. And we're adding this positive charge, all coagulants. I think there's maybe one you know, coagulant that is negatively charged. And the, I've never used it, but there's actually one out there. Um, so we're adding uh, positive charge, whether it's the aluminums or the, the irons or the organic compounds. We're trying to destabilize that colloidal suspension. And again, sometimes it's easier said than done. And sometimes pH is critical to getting that done. So when we talk about coagulation, um, and this is compared to flocculation, we can mix coagulants, you know, for hours. 
and it's not going to affect a coagulant. They're very, very small particles. And, and uh, in here uh, on the screen here, it talks, you know, one to three minutes. That really varies. It all depends on the, the type of mixing. You know, some cases it might need 30 seconds. In other cases, you might need more than that, depending upon the equipment and so forth. So now we're, uh, we're adding our coagulant, and we're starting to form that pen flock. And you guys have all seen those little teeny, I mean, the size of a, of a pen head. So that's when you can start seeing that you're neutralizing that charge. So as soon as we start neutral, neutralizing that charge, things start to happen. And, uh, and if you were to let that, let that uh, sample sit after neutralizing that charge and forming a microflock, over time, you know, that stuff would start to settle slowly in, in, the, in the beaker. So on the left, we have our clonal suspension. Our ideal situation is that we completely neutralize that charge of all that brown water over there. Let's say it's coffee. We add our, uh, we add our coagulant, and we neutralize that charge, and ideally we have the liquid solid separation. That's what we're all trying to do most of the time, right? It's pretty simple, really. The, the devil's in the details, I guess. So types of coagulants, we have organic, Many of you probably have heard, heard of uh, probably the, the first two, DADMAX and polyamines. The formaldehyde resins are used primarily, um, I think prim primarily to take care of paints and things like that, or inks. Um, the tannins, very specific applications for those. I've never even used uh, the PVA, but apparently it's also a uh, organic coagulant. They never used PVA in anything? It's primarily a paper industry. And then we have this big, huge, uh, vast array of uh, inorganics. You're very familiar with the irons of the world and the aluminums. PAC, ACH, those are all very commonly used. And, uh, you know, for specific applications, bentonite clay, and in particular in, in oil treatment and, uh, and paints and things like that, bentonite clays can be really effective treating, uh, you know, Really interesting waste. The one thing about I will I will just highlight on bentonite clays, and Rob, maybe you can <laughs> kind of uh, back me up on this. It really depends on how long you let them mix. You know, you you guys have probably seen that. Well, more probably you more more Jake, but if you let it mix for five minutes, you might see nothing, and if you let it mix for ten minutes, you might have completely different. It might be completely clear. So that's something to keep an eye on with those. I wanted to uh, highlight something because I, I think people really don't understand, uh, you know, what polyaluminum chloride is, and uh, they use it very generically. So I wanted to kind of highlight it for you, and give you an idea of of what I don't know what's going on here. But anyway, there there's essentially two sides of pack on the on the low side, the basicity. And basicity is basically just how they uh, how they uh, manufacture the product, how it's uh, how it's uh, yeah how it's manufactured, and different basicities depending on how long you react the aluminum chloride will give you higher or lower. So aluminum chloride is the lowest basicity, so basically zero, very very low pH, less than one. And on the opposite side of the spectrum, we have aluminum chlorohydrate which is 80% uh, basicity. And you know, in some cases, you want that real low pH, depending upon what you're trying to do. Um, and in other cases, with the aluminum chlorohydrate, you might appreciate having a little bit of a higher pH. Concentration of aluminum itself in aluminum chlorohydrate is the highest concentration of aluminum you can get in solution, at least at that pH. So that's... Uh, Something I wanted is to highlight because I think there's a lot of confusion on PAC because people say, well, it's PAC. Well, what PAC is it? Is it, you know, and, and by the way, on that line, PACs can be basically any basicity. They can create almost any basicity that you need. And sometimes, you know, a 20% is perfect. Sometimes a 40% is perfect. Sometimes you want the highest, especially in the food industry. Lumen chloride hydrate is very popular in the, the food industry. 
All right, so advantages of the inorganics. They're, you know, they're acidic. And in some cases, that can be a big advantage. Well, that can also be a disadvantage because then you have to use something to bring the pH back up. So it all kind of depends on what you're looking for. I mean, inorganics, there's a huge range of applications out there. On a per pound basis, very low cost, and it can be fed neat. It doesn't have to be made down or diluted or anything. It's very, very, you know, fluid. Uh, a disadvantage, again, you know, sometimes the, the acidic nature of it is good. Sometimes not so much. And, uh, yeah, you tend to use a lot. I mean, sometimes it's, you know, into the thousands of parts per million. And it can create a lot of sludge. And depending upon if it's hazardous or not, you know, it, it maybe cost you some extra, extra money. The other thing that is a possibility with uh, with these inorganics, you know, I guess in particular really ferric chloride or ferric sulfate, if, if they're uh, part of a pickling process and you're getting a byproduct, then it could be full of metals. I mean, including, you know, chrome, nickel, any of those kinds of things. There are products out there that are, um, you know, uh, very clean. They're, they're made specifically to be used in really, really, you know, situations where you have to have that really, really good uh, purity level. But that's not always the case, so that's something to remember. Organics. Um, yeah, they're, you know, relatively neutral, usually in that six to seven range. Uh, usually very, very low dosage. There's, there's, there's nothing to add to the sludge, so the sludge that there, that's there is going to be there. Organics don't add anything. And really don't have any uh, impact at all on pH and alkalinity in most cases. This, the uh, disadvantage, of course, again, is that they are neutral pH. Again, sometimes you want that pH to, get, to go down. It just helps. Some, you know, depending upon the concentration, they can be really high, high cost. Some of them are really thick, so they need to be diluted or have post dilution after you're feeding them. I've had situations where the organics, they won't even work. Even if you have a lot of mixing, if you feed them meat, but as soon as you add a little dilution water and they, they hit the application, they work. I, don't, I can't explain why, it's just the way it is. So if you have one that doesn't work, <laughs> you may want to try diluting it. And again, I don't really understand it. It's a physical reaction of some sort. So sometimes the, the best way to go is to take an inorganic and blend inorganic with it. And, uh, you know, ourselves as, as, as well as many other companies have determined that that's a good way to go. But it's, it's you know, specific to the application and, and the, the business that you're, you're doing. So at the end of the day, if we have, if we reach perfection, you know, we, we spend this time and we, we neutralize that charge perfectly, that's known as the isoelectric point. And that's what our goal is. You know, how often do we get there? Not very often. Unless you have a customer that has one of these uh, streaming current detector, where their, their discharge limits are so tight that everything has to be perfect all the time. So you use one of these. This came from a, a industrial laundry. But even in the paper industry, I've seen these things being used more for on-machine applications. But they do work. But like anything else, if, if you can't keep the system clean, you're not going to get uh, you know, the reading that, that you're looking for. So isoelectric point is what we're looking for. So um, just to recap, the rapid mixing of coagulants is really important. You can't put a coagulant in right before the application. You got to give it time to mix, or you're just going to waste it, or you're going to have to use a lot more than you you should. Okay, you know doses, depending upon the product. Some of some of those those uh, uh, um, organic products, you can get away with you know five ten parts per million in some, depending again depending upon the waste, but those inorganics, you know, easily easily into the fifteen thousand especially in a batch treatment process. Jake, I'm assuming you, you guys have reached that at times yeah. or, or, or higher. So um, there is a, a challenge at times if you're, using, if you're using those organics, 
you can overuse them. You can add too much, and you get what's called a cationic reversion. So then everything is completely cationized. How's that? And then and then repel each other, much like they did if they were just uh, negative, negatively charged. So the organics are the ones that are really powerfully cationized, with a lack of a better way to describe that. That makes sense. It's just completely reverts and makes it really hard to treat. That happens very often. And again, I can't I can't emphasize it uh, too much. Mix the heck out of those coagulants, and you're just going to be much much happier with your end result. All right, let's get into our friend these flocculants. So the difference between the the coagulants and the flocculants, well, it's it's significant difference, but primarily these flocculants are used to create take those pen flock and make them larger. So in, in that beaker I showed you before, if we had the pen flock and we just let it sit there, over time it would settle. But this is the real world. We got to get stuff done. You know, time is of the essence. So we had these things called flocculants. People will call them polymers. Polymers is a very generic way of describing, I mean, there's got to be a million different polymers. Flocculants are kind of specific to what we do here in water treatment. So after we hit it with the, the uh, coagulant, very rarely do we ever do it the other way around. Every once in a while, we'll have a situation where we're, for whatever reason, we try the flocculant first and then add the coagulant. And sometimes it works better. But usually, flocculants are the, are the second. And it's just a physical reaction. There's no chemical reaction there at all. And these things are polymers, meaning they're made up of these very, very small things we call monomers. And these things are can be millions of monomers long. Obviously, this is on a small, very small scale, but they can be huge. And they come in a linear form, and they can come really kind of more recently in, in branched forms. And there's reasons uh, for both of those. They come in emulsions. Anybody, can anybody describe what an emulsion is? Come on, Pat, you know what an emulsion is. Yeah, they're hard to mix. <laughs> they, they can really be a mess, yes. So an emulsion is just a, a, a polymer that's basically enclosed in, in an oil droplet. Um, you know, very different than a dry. A dry is just a dry particle. Mannix, I don't know if anybody of you have ever used those. That's kind of an older type of cationic uh, solution. Um, not used as much anymore because there's formaldehyde in those. And then just straight solution polymers. And I know you guys uh, like to use those, Pat, not to pick on you here again. but and of course we have the anionics and the cationics and most of the time in, in the, uh, the metal finishing world, um, anionics are, are most prevalent. In the food processing world, those cationics are, are most prevalent. And the non-anics, I don't even know if I've ever sold more than a couple of drums of non-anic polymer in my whole life. So very rarely used. So um, again, we have these, uh, these linear uh, polymers and or flocculants and these branched ones. And typically on the powder side, that's all we can really manage because of the way that they manufacture these products. On the emulsions, we get a few more choices, or at least one more choice. Uh, but linear branched and cross-linked. Now, when we talk about the linear, that's typically those products are used for simple sedimentation and a clarifier. When we start getting more advanced products like these branched, those are those are used more often for um, sludge dewatering because they're just more resilient. This is just the general rule, not always the case. There's always the exception to the rule. And sometimes we're, you know, we do our tests and we're amazed at what works and what doesn't. But the cross-link ones, those are the newest, that's the newest type, and they're expensive, but they're really, really effective and can produce some really clean, clear water in uh, certain circumstances. So you've all probably heard about molecular weight. Um, you know, like, like it says, you know, higher isn't necessarily better. The, 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 the truth of the matter is you think you know what's going to work when you go in, and then sometimes you're very disappointed because that's the stuff you thought was going to work does not. That's why you have to put the work in up front and, and 
make sure you got the right the right product for the right application. But charge density, that just gives you a little idea of you know how much how many of those cationic charges or negative charges are kind of lined up. And uh, again, the structure really that's more important when we talk about uh, dewatering um, dewatering sludge. All right, so we're going to take those small particles and we're going to make them bigger. So can you overmix a flocculant? What happens? It starts to break their chains, begin to break down. Exactly. And then what happens? You end up back with thin flock. Right? <laughs> right. And then you just have to add more product. Um, and sometimes it could really it could really mess you up. So the flocculants are, you know, they're kind of they need to be handled with kid gloves. You need to kind of, you know, take your time and you wanna, you know, you wanna get a flock that's I, I usually say a small popcorn size. If it gets you know smaller than that, you know more of like a, a a pencil eraser, fine. Depending upon the application and the 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 velocity of water, Joel, to the clarifier, um, sometimes the small ones are fine. But if you can find a product that gives you those big heavy ones, that's usually the best. All right, so here we go. We got that that uh, unstable colloid, but we have added our uh, our coagulant. And now we're going to add the, our flock. In this, in this case, is it a food plant or a metal finishing plant? It's a cationic flocculant. Food plant, right. Thank you. And there we go. That's what it looks like. Again, we really want, we really need to, you know, speed up that process of settling because we have a lot of stuff to treat. We need to add the flocculant. In, in fact, I don't really know of any application where I have not used the flocculant. Can anybody think of one? <laughs> I really can't. Unless sometimes the flocculant produces such a large flock. I'm sorry, the coagulant adds such a large flock, it kind of settles on its own. Very rare. But it, what does that happen? That's kind of this, this video. I used to do this on site with my jar tester, but this is pretty nice. So we've already neutralized with the coagulant. And now we're adding the flock. And this to me looks like uh, chrome, chrome treatment. So that's a pretty nice size flock. And just look at the clarity behind that. So what do you call that, where the all the anionic charges are neutralized? What's that called? You've reached? Isoelectric point. Nice. Ah, that's that's worthy of a poop emoji. <laughs> if you want a poop emoji, you can also have a shirt. But those are those are the, uh, the most popular. All right, I'm gonna move on. So, also very important, you know, how are you gonna make down that, that polymer? So now we're, now we're talking about emulsions here. That's what most people use are emulsions. So you wanna get that concentration 0.1 to 0.5. Again, these are just general rules. I like a quarter of a percent typically. Um, 0.5 can be really thick depending upon the type of flocculant. So if you have it at a quarter of a percent, Kind of works for every flocculant out there. Um, really important on the front end, if, if you're going to use a system like this, you know, get that mixer going, and then add the polymer to the to that vortex. So it really gets, you know, the high energy dispersion. Um, you know, I I know some people. This is the way they do it. Do I necessarily like the, this way? Uh, probably not ideal but I know it's inexpensive and it does work. It just doesn't give you the kind of mixing, the high energy mixing that you're really supposed to have. And give it time. If you wait 20 to 30 minutes, just letting it sit there, the, the oil droplets kind of come off the polymer 
and really allow, because a polymer is kind of a coil, coiled like this, kind of like a Nautilus. And once you hit, hit it with water, it pulls off that oil, and then it sl it's, these things slowly start to unwind and uncurl. And if you use it too soon, you're not going to get the full benefit of the, this, you know, this chain of, of monomers, the polymer. So you let it unwind, you let it do its thing, let it age, and you'll be much happier. We have applications where we have, you know, let's say that the customer was feeding directly out of the drum and not doing any mixing, pre-mixing, and then we put in a mixing system. We have one customer that we saved over $200,000 a year just because we let it sit for 30 minutes. I'm not kidding. Now, that's obviously a very large user of flocculant, but that's just going to show you how much it can impact what you're doing. So, you know, another way of doing it, which I probably like a little bit better, is actually using a polymer feeder. These are designed, and there's, there's, I don't know, dozens of manufacturers of this equipment. Am I right, Joe? <laughs> um, and all of them kind of say the same thing, and they all kind of have their own spin on how they do it. But the important thing is, is that polymer gets in and it hits something and gets that energy, that mixing energy, and it really gets it activated. And this is just one of the brands that we sell. We do like the, uh, the um, what do you call that pump? Uh, Peristaltic, thank you. Peristaltic pumps, man, it has just made things so much easier. I don't know if over the years you guys have, have yeah, Joe is saying yes. If you have a regular diaphragm pump, and they, it has you know the springs, the electronic diaphragm pumps with the little springs. Check, you know how often those check springs get coated with polymer, and with with this, there's no springs. It's just a beautiful thing. The only thing you got to do whoop, is uh, use tigothane tubing. If you ever want to get one of these, use tigothane tubing because regular rubber tubing, the oil swells that rubber and all of a sudden your pump won't work. So, or whatever that's worth. So, um, you know, you really want to get that mixing as you're, this is the application now, actually dosing. Um, you want to get the mixing enough, but not too much because otherwise you're going to have to add more or you might have to start over with your treatment. I mean, it all depends. Um, that's something you kind of have to get a feel for. Every application is a little different. Every system is a little bit different. There's maybe you know more length of pipes or or more tanks, and you want to get that you want to get that dialed in. Um, but usually it's in that you know 30 to 90 second mixing time. And there's nothing really typical about dosages, but generally speaking, that 10 to 30 milligrams per liter is enough of polymer to get things to come together. Now, if we're talking about sludge dewatering, that's kind of a different topic. Usually that's more in the 200 to 400 parts per million for sludge dewatering, okay? But, you know, in, in the, we run across people who call and say, oh my gosh, my filter press is all plugged up and there's this slime all over the claws and gosh, what, you know, what can we do? And I say, well, how much, you know, how much polymer did you get? You said slimy. How much polymer did you, did you have? Well, we had a problem with our polymer makedown system, blah, 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 blah. I said, well, okay, there you go. That's it's way too much polymer. And it can be a problem. It doesn't happen very often, but it, it can happen. And again, you know, as opposed to the coagulants, who you can mix forever at 20,000 RPMs, polymers, got to be careful. All right, so um, let's talk a little bit, you know, more specific, specific about specific applications. Again, generally speaking, as you, you go over seven, a pH of seven, this is why this is why pH is really important because these little things like this. So if your anionic is working well at eight, and all of a sudden your pH goes to six. may not work so well, right? And if on the other side, if you're running a, a food plant and your pH is usually at six and you're using a cationic and they're running sanitation at night and the pH goes to nine, what happens? 
stuff doesn't look so good. So generally speaking, over seven, you want the anionics. Generally speaking, below seven, you use the cationics. Okay. But every application there's a there's a, a, a optimal pH. And it really you have to you have to do the work. You have to play with it to find out what that needs to be. And your sample may need to be pH adjusted on the front end, and it may not. So you got to figure it out, you know, you got to do the work up front in the jar tests, uh, in, in the, uh, the treatment of several samples. And this is something that um, the, the salt environments, you know, some applications, there's, there's high salt content in the water. And, you know, most polymers, you know, will not work. The anionics, if there's a, uh, anionics will work better. And there's even products out there that are called sulfonated products. Those tend to handle that salt environment a little bit better, but still tough, you know, high chloride, high dissolved uh, solids. <clears throat> so some best practices, and, and maybe some of you guys are doing this now, maybe some of you guys are not. Um, Really, a good idea is to put a strainer in there. You know, after the polymer tank, if, if it's a, a tote or a, a, um, a drum, you know, not a bad idea to put a strainer in there because every once in a while you get some of these snot balls that come through there. You know, a little bit of water gets in there in, into the drum or tote, and it creates these little, you know, white globs, and that strainer will take them out. Got to add emulsions to water. If you add water to a Five gallon pail <laughs> or a drum of of uh, emulsion polymer, you are going to have a mess. So kind of like do as you add acid to water, add emulsion to the water. I had a customer the other day who called and said, "My system just isn't working. And can you come up and help me out?" And one of the first things he he said was, "Well, yeah, you know, I had the five gallon pail and I put water in there." <laughs> and, then I, and then I poured it into the, in the mix. I'm like, ooh, yeah, you don't want to do that. He said, oh, I thought it looked kind of funny. And I said, yeah, you don't want to do that. So that one of those things. Most people get that. I'm sure most of you guys understand. Again, op optimal concentration. I like a quarter percent, again, because it works for any, any type of polymer, high molecular weight, low molecular weight. It, it, it just works. Again, if you go to half a percent on a high molecular weight product, it might be so viscous you can't even pump it, depending upon the product. Uh, thirty percent, or I mean, sorry, thirty minutes of aging really helps. If you can't, the more the more you can have, the better. If you have only fifteen minutes, it's better than nothing. So you keep that in mind. Again, uh, peristaltic pumps use tiglothane tubing. We've learned the hard way. Yeah, rubber doesn't work out so hot. So learn from our mistakes. All right, how's everybody doing? Say it with me, so far so good? Okay. All right, so really the, you know, the two uh, major treatments are batch treatment and what's the second one? And this this is maybe poop emoji worthy question. <laughs> Batch treatment and uh, I don't know if I can give you a poop emoji for that though. That's, yeah, yeah, you've been around a long time, Rob. <laughs> so what we do is we take this, we take water and we put it into a, a treatment tank, and a lot of times these wastes. Like many of you CWT people, these wastes are full of TSS, and you may only treat you know seven or eight thousand gallons in a batch, so that's why we use a batch. When we start moving you know beyond eight thousand gallons a day, you know those tanks start getting pretty big. You know twenty thousand gallons a day, you're saying, why am I doing batches? This is a pain, um, and sometimes you consider possibly going to things like continuous treatment. The food industry very rarely um, do they do batch. Yeah. 
although they do have these things. Well, hey, a second. So in these batches, sometimes you'll have do a pH adjustment up front. Sometimes you won't, and you want to add the coagulant. And the coagulant can do two things. It can neutralize the charge. And what else? What if there's phosphorus in there? You can also remove the phosphorus, right? Then we add our, flo our flocculant. We never let, if it's oil, it's going to float. If it's something heavy, it's going to sink. So we, uh, we decant the water off the side, typically. There's ports on the side of the tank. Uh, we pull the sludge off the bottom if it sinks. We'll pull the sludge off the top if it floats. And uh, that's our, our cycle. And a lot of you guys know that cycle well. You could probably think about it in your sleep. So on a, a lab scale, that's what it looks like. You, know, you had the water on top and the solids on the bottom. Again, this is heavier than water, so those solids are going to sink. I think this is a metal finishing kind of a sludge. All right, so on the food side, we have these things called uh, SBRs. So very similar uh, in terms of having a volume of water. These are kind of the smaller. Do you guys have an SBR? Do you, what, what do you guys use at, at your plant? Yeah. We don't have you don't have anything at the moment. Okay, that's right. So you have this big tank, and you t you take all your waste from the from the cheese plant, uh, or the food processing plant, and you put it in this tank. And there's bacteria in there, and you oxygenate it. Some of these SBRs, there's maybe four or five different steps. I think John's going to get a little bit more into detail. I'm just kind of giving you the broad brushstrokes here of what these things do, but. You know, the bacteria do their thing and they reduce the COD or BOD and clean it up. And uh, you, you decant, very similar to a, you know, industrial metal finishing type of a situation, although there's no bacteria in those. Any questions? Anybody ever seen one of those? I bet you Joe has seen a few of those. All right, so now let's move on. And I'm sure people have seen the, that big blue thing. How about the thing on the left there, that equipment? Little little DAF, little digester there. I think that's actually a original center picture there. So our second major category for treatment is continuous flow. And in this situation, we have what's called a lamella clarifier, uh, really commonly used actually in a lot of different industries. You know, if, if, if the waste is heavier than water, it you know, wants to sink. This is one of the options that you can use. You know, people also use ponds and things like that, or clarifiers, real simple systems. But very, very popular. And Joe's gonna talk about those a little bit later. So this is just kind of a, a neat, I saw one of these uh, in person years ago and I just thought this is okay, the neatest we're thing. We're doing a, a video demonstration of um, how an inclined tube settler uh, is um, uh, more efficient than uh, just straightforward settling and this device that you see in front of you is a, 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 a obviously scaled uh, model um, that demonstrates this uh, and I believe this is what a 23 or so degree angle 30 degree angle and um, when we shake this up this time and then place it back. And you can see the particle settling. The one on the left appears to be settling. Or it's not I'll give you one of these. Much <laughs> and, and just so that we can see that this is not anything with that particular tube, when we switch it, again, the incline uh, on the uh, tubes itself or uh, what appear to be um, uh, affecting the, uh, the settling rate of the particles. So this is why they have this thing called an inclined clarifier because it it speeds up the um, speeds up the the settling of solids through some kind of physics I don't really understand why but as you can see it hits the side and that slides down really quick kind of neat um, we've already talked about this a little bit you know again this goes back to primarily the food industry 
we're, we're starting to see more of these uh, dissolved air flotation cells, um, even now into you know the other industries, not just food. Anybody who has a lot of oily waste, we're starting to see these uh, become more and more popular. But essentially, we're talking about you know uh, you know creating real fine bubbles, attaching our our uh, flock to those bubbles, and floating them up. Pretty slick system, and you can get some pretty decent solids coming off of the top of some of these DAFs. And again, Joey's going to talk about these a little bit more in detail a little bit later on. Probably John too. So there's another little video here. Dissolved air flotation or DAP is a water treatment process that removes suspended solids from water using air. This separation is achieved by dissolving air into water under pressure and then releasing the air at atmospheric pressure in a flotation tank. The released air forms tiny bubbles which adhere to the suspended solids in the water, causing the solids to float to the surface where they can be removed by a skimming mechanism. Chemicals can be added to the feed water to improve solids removal. The DAP process can be used to clarify fresh water, processed water, and wastewater so that it is suitable for use or discharge. In some cases, the solids are collected for reuse. Common applications include clarification of municipal water and wastewater and processed water in paper making operations. And a lot, uh, a lot more than that, right? So so the other thing, uh, um, continuous treatment would be uh, activated sludge or biological uh, treatment in particular. Does anybody know what those are? Microbes. Bacteria. Bacteria. Yeah. And you know, you want to what's a little a little uh, footnote here? You know how big COVID nineteen is. One one hundredth the size of a bacteria. Isn't that crazy? How small those little things are. But yeah, this is this is specifically. Uh, okay, I'll give you a poopy emoji. <laughs> it's COVID free. It's got its little bag on it. Um, it is a uh, the most commonly uh, commonly found bacteria in in wastewater treatment. In, in biological wastewater treatment. <clears throat> so there's really two types of the continuous uh, treatment on the, on the a biological side. Activated sludge is, is one, and you'll notice that there's this kind of a tank with, you know, looks like foam. So what we're doing there is actually aerating it, adding oxygen so the bacteria are, uh, are respirating and breaking down all this BOD and COD that is uh, being sent to the plant, that's a wastewater plant from the, whatever they're making in the manufacturing facility, if it's a food plant most of the time. You know, it could be sugar, could be oil and grease, you know, a whole bunch of different things. And uh, in, this, in this case, there is no methane uh, that is produced. That is the, uh, other biological side of things, and that's called a digester. So these digesters are fully enclosed. They may have mixers inside just to keep the, everything kind of you know flowing around. There's a there's a whole bunch of different kinds of digesters. I don't know, maybe you you go into some of that later. later. Okay, we'll, again, we're just trying to skim the surface on some of this stuff. But these are the things that produce the methane gas that people are you know converting to. Uh, CNG and they're using it to run boilers and they're actually producing CO2 in some of these really big ones where they're able to sell that. Um, so all those wastes that we used to kind of waste is now being used to generate, you know, this, these, this, uh, this gas that we can actually use to power things. So it's really kind of neat. You know, all these plants that just to just dump it down the drain, um, they're building these digesters, and in, in Wisconsin, it's kind of been a thing. I mean, even you can even power generators to produce electricity. I don't know what, what the last 
10, 15 years, these have become really kind of popular across the whole country. But, uh, you know, there's even a, 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 a organization you can join that talks about digesters nonstop. All right, so we're going to have a little treat, uh, treatment uh, methods quiz here. At a pH of three and a half, are there more hydrogen or hydroxide ions present in the wastewater? If you could raise your hand, Brittany. Hydrogen. Yes, that is correct. She said hydrogen if you did it here. Oh, sorry. Okay. Are uh, coagulants anionic or cationic? It's okay, Pat. I can see your I can see your eyes. You want to answer? They can be both, but usually they're cationic. Oh, you must remember that from last year. I do. <laughs> All right. Uh, does an anaerobic digester use oxygen? No. Not. Okay. What does it use? No. <laughs> I really didn't. I really didn't tell you more than that. So that's that. Oh, we're. All right, uh, name one method of liquid solid separation. We've talked about a whole bunch. Yeah. DAF. Is that what you said? Yeah. DAF. Uh, you guys got your masks on. It's kind of hard to hear you. So, Right. Absolutely. What does DAF stand for? I'll, I'll give you a poop emoji if you get this. Dissolved. <laughs> well, you know, I'll give you a poopy much anyway. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Okay, now we're going to talk a little more about sludge dewatering. We kind of covered it a little bit when we talked about flocculants, but a whole, but a whole different animal here, really. Um, you know, kind of simple things like, you know, many of you guys probably know what a plate and frame is. That's over on the left. Centrifuge, that's kind of a not as prevalent in our industry. If, if it is, it's probably in, in the you know, oils and grease and, and rendering. That's where you mostly found those. Uh, the middle one there is an MD uh, multi disc filter. And then one everybody knows about is that um, uh, belt press there. Very, very popular, especially in the municipal market. So let's talk about the plate and frame. Simple to operate. How do you guys think about that? Is that, is that an accurate statement? <laughs> In theory, it's supposed to be really simple to operate. <laughs> um, you know, you, you put stuff in and you squeeze the water out. Um, really, the, 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 the nice thing about a plate and frame isn't that it's really that easy to operate. It takes a lot of work. But you get that cake dryness. If you have a, a F006 sludge, you know that's hazardous, and you need you need to you know you have those boxes, and you need to get as much cake in there as you can. This is what you use. It is the best. Um, you know, I, it says works well on sludge that is hard to do water, and I, I guess generally speaking, that is true. Sometimes you may have to add a little. Um, diatomaceous earth to make it a little bit easier to, to filter out. There's, there's ways you can um, make this, make these plate and frame presses operate for you. Pat, I hate to pick on you again, but you, you put some nasty things through that plate and, frame, plate and frame filter press of yours up in Oshkosh. And, and kudos to you. It works well. Yes. So disadvantages, I mean, cycle times can be really long. You know, they can be a couple hours, but they can be a couple days, depending upon what your waste stream is and how the equipment that you have set up uh, to operate it. It is batch. It is definitely labor intensive. Um, and if you have a problem, it can be really ugly. You can have a mess everywhere. And you'll go home and you will not be happy because your pants will be all full of brown baby poop. <laughs> I, I've been there, done that myself. Um, the cloth replacement is a big pain. Uh, but we're going to talk about something a little bit later on. I'm not going to give it away, uh, but there's a way, there's a, a system now that they have that makes that easier. And in most cases, definitely you're going to need to add other chemicals 
Um, you're going to need a, you know, a coagulant. Sometimes you feed a flocculant beforehand um, just to make the dewatering process a little bit more, uh, happen a little more quickly. So you can, when they say cycle times are long, you can enhance that, but not in all, not in every case. So that's kind of what the plates look like. You know, you have to have a big old, you know, two inch air diaphragm pump to pack that press. Um, sometimes you'll have one that you can expand, which is kind of nice. So you, in some cases, it's just, it's just a big metal bar that goes in there and you just pull that bar out and then you can fill it with more plates. So that's kind of a neat thing. Um, you can CIP clean them. Um, I would say if I was, you know, somebody who owned one of these, I would want to have that ability to clean it because it's just going to make your life that much easier. Um, plate shifters, if you have these big, huge 1,000 millimeter or 1,500 millimeter plates, these things are huge. There's no way you're going to move that by yourself. you got to have a plate shifter. Even in some of the smaller ones, the 800s, um, people will get the plate shifter, so it's just a little bit easier. And if you're an operator, you like having a plate shifter. And I'm going to show you how those work. I like these videos because you know people don't really understand how these how these things how these things work. So it just fills up those cavities one at a time. That's where this cycle time kind of thing comes in. Depends how fast your pump is pumping to punch to pump the sludge in. But all these cavities and crevices need to be filled. And hopefully you don't have a whole bunch of you know polymer in there that's going to plug up all the cloths. So you pull it apart, and then ideally, ideally these things fall out like, you know, hockey pucks. Not always the clay, always the case. <laughs> Steve, you're you're shaking your head. Uh, we've, we've yeah, and it hasn't been so pretty, baby. So. It can be. If they're a smaller uh, press, you just you can pull it apart by hand. But if, if they're bigger, then you have these, it's like a pneumatic system. It kind of clamps onto the, the plate and then helps you pull it apart. And then that's, ideally the sludge falls out. Doesn't always work that way. Uh, in the uh, best case, yes, that's the way it works. All right, belt press is kind of nice because it's automatic. You don't have to go in there and you know pull plates apart and so forth. You know, typically we have, uh, we add a flocculant ahead of time, a dewatering aid, we call it. And, um, you know, th that, this is the sludge, you know, just going across the table here. And the water will drain right through if you have the right product. They're quiet. Um, they're, they're relatively easy to control, really. You just have to find out the best location to add the, the polymer, typically, or the flocculant. Um, you know, they're... They do require a lot of wash, uh, washing. The cake is not, you know, it's you're not going to get 3% out of a, a belt press. Maybe if you're lucky, you'll get 15%. Um, and that's probably, again, depending upon the waste stream or the sludge, can be kind of hard. Yeah, if you have a high uh, FOG, you know, oil, real oily waste, then you don't want to use one of these guys. But really nice because it's just continuous. It makes, you know, if you have the right waste stream, make your job pretty easy. Um, you know, again, you can see, you can see a P clean them. Sometimes a flocular ahead of time. And I don't know if you're going to talk about this at all, Joe, but something, oh, I think you are. These, these floculars, these serpentines help to mix the polymer before it goes on to the machine. Um, and yeah, most of the time you're going to have a coagulant on flocculant. You're not going to be able to get away from that. Very rare. So Andrus is a, a brand. There's a whole bunch of brands of these things out there. And they don't all look like this. There's, I don't know, probably hundreds of different designs, but they all have these belts on them. And they have nip points where you squeeze the water out. It's on a, it's on a big reel. And here the, here the sludge is coming in. So the water is draining out through that blue uh, cloth. It's like a polypropylene cloth. 
and then we're gonna put it through those nip points and squeeze out more water. This one has a whole bunch of nip points. If, if your polymer's not working, sludge comes squirting out the sides of those nip points, and that's not good. And then you can put that on a conveyor, auger it out, and put it into a truck. But again, you're not talking 30% solids, you're talking 15, that's about it. All right, centrifuge. Um, again, this is, I, I mentioned earlier, this is primarily used, I mean, really, in rendering plants. Uh, people who have high oil and grease content, they actually can separate the brown, brown grease and from uh, you know, other contaminants. Really expensive to run, uh, really expensive to fix. What else can we say about centrifuges? There's only, you have two choices. You can have clean water or you can have dry sludge. You really can't have both. So if you say, okay, you know, the customer wants dry sludge. There's a way you can configure this to give you really dry sludge. And if, you, and if the customer says they want, you know, uh, really clear filtrate, there's ways you can do that, but you can't really get both. A lot of energy, you know, these things are spinning at, I don't know how many thousands of RPMs, hundreds of thousands of RPMs? Okay. So there's a lot of, you know, opportunities for things to kind of go wrong. In, in a, in a uh, the way applications are, it's, it's the only thing you can really use. So, but, you know, expensive to maintain. And there's people who talk about doing this, and I can maybe point them in a little different direction if I think it's going to be a, you know, a disaster. And here's just a, a touch screen of all the things you can kind of change uh, on one of these things. There really isn't a ton of things you can change. Um, but again, you get one or the other. Clarity or solids, real high solids. Uh, and they typically use a lot of uh, sludge dewatering aid. I mean, these things are, it takes a ton of polymer to make things, things run properly in most cases. They call them decanters. You know, there's, I don't know, again, how many uh, different manufacturers there are. Centresis is the one I think that's in this area. And maybe you guys. Okay. But there, you know, there's all different kinds of shapes and sizes. The key is to understand what, again, looking at the flocculation um, training, portion of the training, you want to get a product that is really resistant to shear because all that movement in there is shearing uh, the flocculant. And we probably would not use a linear flocculant in this application. We would use those cross-linked or branched products because it really gives you a really nice, so the filtrate's coming off the right side and the, the cake is coming off the left. You know, not a really good way. Um, if you, again, you want really high solids, probably not gonna get you to where you would want if, you, if, that, if that's what you need. Okay, screw press. This is uh, something that's becoming more and more popular out there. Um, you know, I, I don't, again, there's a whole bunch of different suppliers out there. You know, automatic is always nice. Can handle a lot of stuff. Not nearly as bad as a centrifuge in terms of energy. Relatively low maintenance, depending upon what, what you're putting through there. You, know, you might just have to re replace the screw or the screens on it. Again, these are pretty, you know, pretty high polymer users, kind of hard to clean. Um, and if you do have to maintain it, it how, depending on how big it is, I've seen huge, you know, 50 feet long. I mean, you guys are gonna have, how big is yours gonna be? Is that 50 footer? Uh, probably like 25. Is it 25? Okay. But that's a big, that's a big screw inside of that, that screw press. Boy, I'm, I'm uh, really being kind to Andrews here, aren't I? <laughs> I've seen a this this style in a, in a you know paper mill, a um, whole bunch of different applications for this kind of screw press. But again, what we're trying to do is just squeeze the water out, 
These do take, again, another, this is another type of application where you would need those special flocculants, either the branched, um, because, of the, because of the shear forces that are applied inside the unit. So obviously the, on the left-hand side is where you're getting most of the squeezing. Most of the water is actually coming out on the front end, but then on the back, on the, on the, on the back end is where you're getting your cake. Just another method, method of dewatering. You know, a lot of applications out there. This, is, this isn't, a, isn't a bad device to use. That's just showing how, it, how it's cleaning. Let's move on. Um, Multi-disc filters. How, how uh, I mean, I, these are just kind of, this is kind of a recent yeah. thing, really, the last five, 10 years, probably. Um, and these, these, are, these are units that you can kind of uh, add on to and so forth. Um, it, it, they do give you, typically, a lot of, how do I say this? A lot of options to to modify and, and improve the way that these things operate. But they have flocculators up front, where the, you can actually uh, you know slow the uh, the mixer, making the the cake potentially drier on the other end, or or increase the mixer to make the cake drier. You can uh, mess around with the the screw speed. The screw you know moves like this. Sometimes you can slow it down or speed it up. You can you can change a lot of things. These things are really pretty adjustable. I guess, I guess my point, and uh, they can they can make a pretty uh, nice nice cake. And there's a whoop. Why didn't that one work? All right, let me try this. Whoop, where did it go? <laughs> All right, well, I guess we're not going to see it. Um, one of those technical uh, difficulties. It, um, let's just go back. So, I mean, this is this is the kind of cake dryness that we see coming off of these things. What would you say, Joe? Highest cake, 15%? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a little bit higher than that. 15, 18% solids. So, not bad. So if you are uh, deciding to take this on as your, uh, uh, yourself, you know, this is the kind of equipment that you need to use. You know, get a, get a, get a beaker and a, a filter. I have an example of, of that stuff here. So there's a, uh, if you don't pass that around, that's a, So what we're trying to do here with all of these dewatering devices is come up with the the best drainage. And again, we talked about the different kinds of polymers that you can use, our dewatering aids, flocculants. Just a matter of spending the time up front and, and uh, putting a lot of work into it and coming up with the best, the best scenario. So we basically just take polymer and we add... Um, that polymer to the sample of the waste stream and just kind of move it back and forth like this. And then we run it through that uh, Buchner funnel and measure the, the volume of, of water that comes through and the clarity. Sometimes the water is really clear and sometimes it isn't. Usually pretty easy to, to figure out which product is uh, superior. Now, if you're talking about a centrifuge, because of the, the forces that are inside of a centrifuge, Testing is a little bit different. We use one of these uh, food processors, try to you know uh, enact or duplicate, if, if you will, you know how a centrifuge might work. Really high shear forces, so it's a little bit different. We you know we'll tend to uh, pour our sample in there with a with a the polymer, and then again measure the filtrate and see how things look, and that's what the what can kind of come out of that. So which product would you pick if you had a choice here? So the, the 30 seconds is the amount of time that we recorded, the filtrate going through the filter, 30, 60, and 90. The products are all down below. So if you were looking at 
Which one of these would you buy? 1228, 1230, or 1232? Anyone want to take a stab at it? I know these charts are just hard, aren't they? Why are, why are charts so hard and graphs? Because you have this kind of drainage. This is the product that, that we decided to go with. This one looked pretty good up front, but it kind of slowed down after a while. And why, why might that be? Because the polymer that we used was not a branched polymer. It was a linear polymer, so it kind of broke down over time. So those are the kinds of things that you'll see. And if somebody comes in your plant and wants to you know, help you figure out you know, how to dewater your sludge, if they're not using this equipment and they're just doing a jar test, you're not gonna know enough information to make a good, a good decision, okay? So this is just a little, uh, little guide, kind of helping you decide if you are gonna be buying, uh, purchasing a piece of equipment like this, you know, you know, if uh, saving energy is important to you, then you need to look out here and find out which ones, you know, aren't going to use a lot of energy. If cake solids is really important to you, you want to find the one that has the highest cake solids. If that filtrate's got to be gin clear, uh, then you would probably pick, you know, one of these other, you know, one of the other devices. So just a, a, a quick snapshot. I think all of you guys are going to get this presentation, by the way, uh, sent to you. All right, which sludge dewatering method is best suited for oil and grease? Centrifuge. Absolutely, there's no question about that. Is a centrifuge designed for continuous or batch treatment? Anyway? Continuous, excellent. Does a plate and frame work via pressurization or vacuum? Pressure, absolutely. How high? How high do you want to take a plate and frame? <laughs> you don't want to go too high. Start squirting out the size. So maybe 80 PSI is probably about the max usually. Um, does the screw press require a dewatering aid? Yes, sure does. You know, 90% of the time, they're going to require a dewatering aid. Uh, 